Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Yeah, good morning. This is a, a nice cozy room to talk about VR, right? Um, uh, Epic Games, you know, traditionally, like I said, we're a games company. We, we make things for PC, for consoles, for mobile devices. Um, we're all very passionate about new technology, so once VR came around, we dive right in and started learning it and experimenting and, and finding ways that we can build new tools and technologies that we in turn put in the engine to make available to all developers so that anybody can go, you can go download Unreal Engine 4 for free right now. Um, we made it free back in March. Anybody can use it. Um, and we have a ton of like learning content around that as well so that if you have an idea of VR, you can just jump in and, and start building, right? And start, start experimenting. Um, today, specifically, you know, I think when we look at VR, it's still very, very early days. Um, there's a lot we're learning. You know, the last talk he was mentioning, uh, if you mess with the camera, you're going to make people throw up, for example. Um, there's all kinds of cool things that we're learning we can do around immersion and presence that we can't do with the 2D screen. Um, but the, the fact is, is we're still, I think we're far from identifying exactly what the killer app for VR is going to be. You know, it might be casual experiences. It might be these awesome cinematic shorts, you know, like um, straight out of Hollywood kind of thing. Um, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So from our point of view, uh, we're in the space of rapid iteration, right? Try this idea, see if it works, see what doesn't work about it, and that inspires us to go to the next thing, right? And, uh, and along the way, <clears throat> anything we can do to help like, improve that process, um, then it's a huge, huge win for us. And one of the first things we realized is, hey, traditionally when you're building games or any sort of interactive content, uh, you've needed a programmer, right? And you know, obviously there's a lot of programmers, but it's really inconvenient to always have to have another person in that iteration loop, right? Um, so we found a lot of success with visual programming as a way to empower people who have never written code in their life, nor do they want to, um, to actually create end-to-end -end entire VR experiences. Um, and to that, the basics of visual programming is, well, A, it's, it's a visual, right? You know, traditionally programmers, you're in there, you're writing text, you're compiling. Um, it's, it's a very arcane and kind of process that not everybody has the right <laughs> brain structure for. Um, and the funny thing is, is a lot of your expert programmers naturally are building that sort of intuitive visual map of how code is structured and all that together. Well, what visual programming does is actually make that structure, uh, you know, a first-class citizen. So immediately you can see where, how are things hooked up together? Where is the execution flowing, right? And the great thing is, is you get that close to the sort of a drag and drop style of creation, right? You can have really nice contextual things. Um, and you're taking away a lot of that complexity and just exposing, you know, mass amounts of functionality in a very simple to understand uh, node, right? If I were to make a character walk across the stage, you know, from a code point of view, it'd play animation, run some physics, blah, 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 right? Um, but with visual programming in the engine, we can make that as simple as a node that you drag and drop and say, you move here from there, right? And it's a much more intuitive way to actually build these things. Um, Visual programming, it's been around forever. I think the most interesting cases like uh, that's been used to manage like chemical plants and like, you know, flow of all kinds of stuff uh, from GUI designers to audio mixing, all kinds of fun things, right? Um, so we definitely are not inventing the notion of visual programming by any means, but we are learning a whole lot about how to make it more productive for rapidly creating these things, right? Um, Node-based graph editors are definitely the most common, and that's the model we've adopted for ours. Um, and to show you an example of that, uh, Blueprints is what we actually call our core um, visual programming tool. Basically, this is sort of the, the heart of all the logic potentially in your experience uh, can be piped through this. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, this allows our designers to completely make an experience uh, without ever having to talk to an engineer. Um, you know, <laughs> about 10 years ago when we were working on Gears of War, for example, our production pipeline for designers would be like, hey, I have this crazy idea, let me write it out like in a nice document and then go have a meeting with the, with the programmers and try to convince them that it'll be fun, that we should totally do it and they should do it this way and think it through. And then, then the designer would go away, the engineer would implement it and the next day the feature comes in the next build and then, oh, it didn't quite you know, work the way we thought it was. So you have this like really back and forth cycle. What happens when we first introduced visual scripting there was now the designer's like, hey, I have this crazy idea. I can go make it right now. I can prove it to myself. I can rapidly iterate. And before I even talk to that engineer to actually make it a full feature in our game, it's a working prototype, right? There's, there's so less uh, ambiguity. And that, that iteration cycle is just a massive, massive improvement, right? 
Um, and the cool thing too about just something about the visual nature is it, it's just far more accessible, right? I think when a lot of people first get into engineering or even any games development, it can be very daunting, right? There's a lot of complex tools out there. And we find this approach is a, a great way to simplify and ease people into it. Um, and one of the other great things too is, you know, we're building visual content, right? So it's fantastic opportunity to have the, the content that is actually going to be on the screen right next to the, the logic driving it, right? And you can see the actual impact of every step side by side um, as you're dropping down these nodes and connecting things together. Um, to kind of give you guys a sense of what it's like to, you know, a day in the life of a Blueprints person, I got a little time lapse here. Let's see if we can make it play. This is just me for about 30 minutes. Um, having some fun with one of our sample contents and just doing a little time lapse. But the key things to look at here is it's really just drag and drop, drag and drop, um, test it out, drag and drop, drag and drop, you know, tweak, test, tweak, test, tweak, test. Um, and it's very, very quick to, to get it going. Um, this is our timeline tool that, you know, notion of at this point, do this sort of thing, right? We try to integrate that notion of keyframing right in there as well. Um, okay, maybe this video is a little long. <laughs> <clears throat> and at some point, if you fast forward this, you know, another day or two, I'd have something I could actually publish on a store, right? Um, a great story about that is, uh, you know, when Flappy Bird came around, one of our artists, um, not a technical guy at all, but very passionate, <laughs> he's like, hey, Flappy Bird, I bet I can do that. And he went and did it. And like a, a single night, he created what we called Tappy Chicken. And then we actually went ahead and published that in, uh, you know, the app stores as a nice proof point of like, yes, this is totally viable, right? Uh, cool. Now I'll talk specifically a little bit about some of the VR stuff we've built um, and kind of break it down a little bit. One of the, the first ones we built, well, I guess not the first, but one of the earlier VR demos we built for, um, I think it was the unveil of the Oculus uh, DK2, in fact, it's called Couch Nights. Um, the basic concept here is that it's a, uh, we put you in a realistic environment, we give you a body, so you have that sense of presence of existing in truly a virtual environment. Um, and it's a shared experience. There's another guy over here sitting with you, um, and since there's head tracking, when he moves his head, we reflect that in his avatar. So you really get that sense of like, wow, I'm no longer alone and isolated in VR. I'm having a, this awesome shared experience. And then we took it a step further and said, hey, why don't you control these cool little cutesy fighty characters and go battle it out? So you have this sort of meta, meta VR experience where I'm in VR and I'm controlling a virtual avatar on top of that, right? Um, and all kinds of fun things come out of that because one of the great things about these characters is my favorite thing to do is you put somebody in there and they don't know what to expect and you take that little character and you make it jump on their virtual lap and then you see them like freak out, right? Because it just, it's so immersive. They've already lost themselves in the presence and being there that they're like, oh, totally. The other fun thing is, um, uh, you know, we give you a body, body, you know, you put some jeans on or whatever. And so many people would sit in there like, well, that's not my jeans. It was like, they already were willing to believe, right? They wanted that, <laughs> that connection to be there. Um, but yeah, and the other fun thing about this is I think when we first started, you know, sat down, hey, we need to build a VR demo. We're like, how about a mech chomping down the street, blowing things up or something like that? And we started there and through massive iterations of trying things, this is actually where we ended up, right? So that was the real power for us is in that rapid iteration using visual programming that our artists were just able to go wild with ideas, quickly test things out, and then we end up with something that was actually quite fun. Um, and definitely, if you're ever experimenting with VR, I definitely encourage you to think about the shared social experiences, right? I think um, I, you were touching on a little bit, the isolation of VR can be a real issue, right? And there's gonna be a lot of stigma around that. Um, but conversely, it's, it's, it's very magical once you have that notion of, hey, I am, I'm here with somebody, and together we can go anywhere, any reality, you know, real or imagined, um, and do interesting things together in that space in a way we never could before, right? <clears throat> um, I have a little short capture here I wanted to show you just uh, quickly um, how the execution flows. If you look to the right, so on the left, I'm actually you know, playing the game, moving the character around. On the right, you'll see the execution actually uh, light up as I'm doing different actions, and you can see how things are triggered and where things are flowing. And the great thing is like, say, hey, I've got some bug I'm trying to track down. We have the same notion of debugging where you can set a breakpoint um, that'll automatically pause the game whenever you hit that condition and take you exactly where it is. And you can say, step by step, oh, okay, now I see what it's doing. Let me rewire, fix, and go, right? Um, and that whole thing, again, about using that sort of rapid iteration um, and, and having it side by side so you can see the exact moment when something going wrong, where it was, it's very powerful, right? Um, this is something that's really hard to do, uh, honestly, with just traditional programming tools. <coughs> Speaking of that, 
Um, you know, visual programming, awesome, awesome tool, but it's not a full replacement for you know a traditional C++ programming. Um, performance is one of the key things to keep in mind. Um, generally, we see anywhere from eight to ten x the performance uh, comparable to C++ code. Um, and there's also a temptation a lot of times when people first approach visual programming to, to sort of expose everything and try to mimic exactly step by step what you would do in programming. And if you do go on that path, you're really not doing yourself a service. You're just going to make it very frustrating and cumbersome. The real magic is when you're coalescing these bits of logic and, and functionality into very small manageable chunks, right? Um, and you're able to quickly piece those together. And as I mentioned before, uh, it's really the, the key thing there is show um, exactly with this step, what am I doing? How is it impacting the content on screen, right? And being able to just see that side by side is very powerful. <clears throat> Another VR th uh, demo we built after Couch Nights um, was called Showdown. I don't know if anybody here has had a chance to check it out. We built for Rockus Connect. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, we're still quite happy with that one. Um, our, our whole intent there was uh, take a step back from the magic of meta VR and crazy things we couldn't do before and just say, hey, what, what happens if we push for high fidelity, right? Let's just try to have a very simple cinematic experience. Um, and actually, I've captured a, a video of it here. It doesn't sort of give you a sense of the experience. <laughs> That's one of the great things, the dangerous thing of VR, right, is jump scares are even more, more impactful, right? Um, uh, we actually did another demo uh, with, in partnership with Weta um, around, it's called Thief in the Shadow, where we brought, put you in the treasure hall with uh, Smog, you know, the giant dragon. Um, and it's great, I'd sh you know, we show ourselves, developers, people in VR, they'd be like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool, it's a dragon, he looks great. And then I'd show people who have nothing to do with games or technology, and they're like ducking under the table, like, oh my god, this thing's going to eat me, right? Like, the, the power there to, to really convince people is amazing. Um, so we can do great things, but also, I know there's a lot of people that are like, ooh, VR is going to about horror experiences, right? I'm like, god, no, please, I can't, you know, you're going to give people heart attacks. <laughs> um, the funny thing about this, or the fun thing about this thing is it is cinematics, and you would say, well, there's no interactivity. Why would I need any sort of logic behind it? Um, but we actually use our Blueprint system to control the camera path, to trigger all the audio, those effects blowing up, flipping the car, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and this was a really small uh, team that put this together. I think it was two and a half guys over six weeks that were able to, to piece this together, right? Um, very, very quick. A lot of the challenges, honestly, were spent on more of like, you know, the challenges of VR, you've got to render at at least, you know, 60, if not 90 frames a second, depending on the device. And so trying to hit that low fidelity was, was quite an interesting challenge, right? Let me skip over it again here. <coughs> um, so kind of reiterating some of the big benefits, right? Uh, previously, you needed a programmer to build things. Now you can do it without programming, right? Um, that being said, it's not exclusive to that. We actually internally end up going back and forth very often. Sometimes if it's a small ex experience or a prototype, uh, we do it all entirely in blueprints and don't even have to do any engineering. Um, but oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take that prototype, okay, this is what you're trying to build, let me write some code now to simplify that for you so it makes it even easier the next time you want to use that functionality or we can share that functionality, right? Um, and that's great too, I don't know if you guys have much uh, experience working with engineers, but they tend to be grumpy and they tend to get even more grumpy when you come and pester them and ask for things, right? So we found it just overall a big win for our team in the fact that, hey, they can go off and do their thing over here and we don't feel like we're wasting each other's time as much, right? Um, 
the other fun thing too is it, it just these these nuggets of functionality, these prototypes, these little demos. Um, because of the visual nature, it's very easy to basically grab those things, package them up, and drag them and drop them into our new project. Oftentimes when we start a new you know, VR demo or game demo or whatever the case may be, we're really just harvesting all the pieces of things we built before and, and getting to that sort of first viable, that MVP as quickly as possible. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it allows us to get to that sort of, <laughs> I say fail faster here and see results quicker. It's a little pessimistic, but, but to the point of like VR, we don't know every idea of what's going to work or how it's going to work, and there's often a lot of surprises, right? So I think it's really, really important to be focusing your efforts on spending your time trying those things out, learning what works so you can actually get to the magic faster, right? Um, and I think that's basically the crux of it. Oh. One other thing, um, you know, we've really taken this to heart. I've been talking about blueprints, but we use a visual programming for, for multiple tools. So the one on the left here is actually our, our AI behavior tree tool. It allows you to, you know, traditional state machines of when this happens, these are the things I respond to, all that good stuff, right? Uh, the top right is our very simple case of an animation blend tree. So blending between different poses and run that's all controlled through our, our visual scripting system as well. And then our material system that allows you to build shaders. You know, traditionally that's been a very... Um, technical thing, and now it's you know it's been a huge win for for people using Unreal to be able to just drag and drop and create you know those photorealistic materials and whatnot. I think this is my probably redundant recap, but you never made a game before. This is a great place to start. You know you don't even have to be a programmer. Um, the great thing about this too is some games have already jumped ahead and and kind of you know shown us what's possible um, beyond you know, turning it into a playful experience of visual programming, right? Minecraft is like the, the best example I can think of. Um, they have this notion of redstone bricks and people are doing crazy amounts of things. They're building like computers within a game that play games, right? They're just taking it to extreme levels. And my favorite thing about that is these people are spinning this as like, it's fun for them. They're playing, they're, they're creating through play, right? And it's, it's very inspiring for us as we look at, you know, obviously we're starting with a more professional set of tools, but you know, how far can we take this? And I think it's really interesting when you look at, hey, the real promise of VR someday is we've got to go build that holodeck. We're going to build the metaverse, right? Maybe, probably not five years, maybe 10, who knows, right? Um, but at some point it's going to happen, right? And one of the reasons that will be so compelling is you'll be able to manipulate those realities in real time, right? And so we'll need tools like this to give you that ability to actually control and manipulate, right? Um, and then you get to the, yeah, the, the end experience of like the matrix, right? And stop time or my favorite thing to, to tell people is like, Hey, maybe I decided I don't like you anymore. And so every time I see you, I'm going to remap you. Right. And wouldn't that be amazing of like, I know actually a better example is like, there's a, I'm making a, a game with unicorns in it, for example. And I see my unicorn is like running into the wall and I can walk over in VR and double tap on his head. And phew, there it is. There's the brain and I can rewire it, fix it, update it on the fly. And so you actually, there's that sort of potential magic point in the future where I'm fully immersed in VR, and I, I'm finding less and less reasons to come out of that experience, right? Um, which, again, with all things VR, can be equal parts frightening and exciting, right? You know, um, you take like the Wally -E example, where we just get so obsessed with VR, we stop caring about anything, um, or we can do magical things, right? But, anyways, that's it. So happy to answer any questions, but thank you. Give it up for Ray Davis. Hi, uh, great job on the talk. I just had a question kind of following up on the last example that you're giving, but <laughs> is there gonna be support so that you can actually like position things in VR, in Unreal anytime soon? Uh, I, I think it's something we're definitely interested in. It's not something that would be like active development right now, um, but there's, we've definitely had a few brainstorm sessions of like, hey, what, what could we do with that, right? I think some things are really natural as far as being able to lay out geometry or you know carve out holes and walls and stuff like that, um, but as I mentioned, like the the rewiring of blueprints and logic on the fly, that's that's a pretty challenging thing we haven't quite gotten into yet. But I I'm almost assured that we will do it someday, right? Cool. Hi, great talk. Um, okay. I, I'm curious oh, as you get um, you know as you, we we people do figure out great games uh, mm -hmm. using your your technology uh, for one VR platform. Mm -hmm. If you're already thinking about, you know, if you make something work for Oculus, it, uh, would you be able to tune the engine to, you know, output the, the same game for yeah. uh, another VR platform? So with Unreal Engine, we actually support all the modern VR devices, I would say. Um, we started with Oculus just because we happen to be friends with those guys from way back when. Um, but we have support for HTC Vive. Um, there's actually a, uh, a game called Gunjack by CCP. is a, a Gear VR uh, game they just built on UE4. They announced it last week at China Joy. Um, the only one we haven't really jumped on yet would probably be cardboard because we're a little skeptical on making sure there's a consistent enough 
performance and computability to make a, a good VR experience for people. But um, yeah, it's definitely one of the things we take to heart with the engine is build your content once, and as much as we can get it to click this button, and now it's over here, and on this platform and that platform, um, that's definitely one of the things we strive for. Uh, I don't think anybody's built a VR experience that goes across mobile and, say, like Oculus type kits. I don't, I don't know of any one title that's really shipped yet. I mean, we're still, well, you can't really buy the devices yet except for Gear VR. So I assume you'll see that quite rapidly in the next year when those devices are available, right? Um, it is an interesting challenge, though, because when you look at building an experience for mobile VR, you have some other constraints that you don't have, and vice versa. You know, with Oculus, I've got this handy little wire that you know gets me tethered to a big box. Um, but with Gear VR, I have freedom of movement, um, but I don't have real positional tracking, right? So it sort of limits the the type of experience. You also have to concern uh, about battery and even temperature, for example. So it, it'll be an interesting challenge to create one experience that actually crosses mobile and I would say, sort of seated or tethered VR. Am I getting off easy? Oh. Nicole Lazar from Zero Design. Uh, there are many genres, many game genres, and mm -hmm. I was curious, and then only a subset of them work for VR, which is the track we're in today. I mm -hmm. uh, was curious about what, uh, what genres uh, are, is Blueprint um, most keyed to? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, I don't think, you know, Blueprints itself for visual programming, it's sort of agnostic to the type of content. It's more about um, maybe the level of complexity that you're going for. Uh, in the gaming space, if you were building a game like GTA, for example, with massive amounts of complexity and simulations, then you may opt for a more native C++ solution just because performance is critical to you or something like that, right? Um, but as I was saying earlier, I think VR, it's, we're seeing a lot of like, you know, VR shorts, right? You know, most experiences are three to five minutes. So I think we're more in the say of like, let's just focus on getting as many variety of experiences out there. Um, and honestly, yeah, we, <laughs> our VR content team is, I, I like to call them, um, tech ninjas, they're not engineers, they're not really artists, they're just these guys that know how to go in here and wire things together. Um, and every time we go about these, honestly, it's, it's so hard to keep them on track sometimes. Like, hey guys, I know you have this crazy idea, like uh, there's a pirate boat adventure they wanna do now, and this guy's got a bow and arrow over here, and I'm like, hey, could we all just take a step back and work on the same thing together, right? But that's sort of the, the, the power of it is that they're, they're constantly free to be just like, oh, I woke up with a crazy idea, let me go see if I can build that, right? So like, a, like another engine has a special like 2D layer, 2D mode, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of casual games uh, mm -hmm. run on. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of casual mechanics in the research that we've been doing mm -hmm. uh, tend to work pretty well in VR, mm -hmm. whereas the racing and driving and more hardcore game mechanics, yeah. uh, less, less so. Yeah, absolutely. So I was curious, is there anything that you guys are doing to address you know, more casual game styles? Um, so with, with UE4, we actually have um, a 2D system as well. We call it Paper 2D um, for doing you know, more casual type games. And um, uh, we, we personally, like at the company, tend to ship, you know, Infinity Blade is probably our most well-known um, mobile game. Um, but there have been plenty of teams using UE4 for more casual type experiences. Um, it's curious, 2D and VR, I don't know what that kind of looks like, but maybe there's some interesting stylistic things you can do there. Yeah. All right, give it up for Ray Davis. Right. Thank you.